What's going on everybody? Mortem here, this time bringing you the 56 games I reviewed this year ranked. A slight bit less than last year's 61, most of that can be attributed to the fact that Baldur's Gate 3 took up a serious chunk of time, and I'm actually not done with it again, I have to go back and do the honor mode now. But in spite of that, it's been a pretty crazy year for game releases all around. A lot of great ones, a lot of not so great ones that we'll get into. Nonetheless, a few things I want to talk about here at the beginning. First and foremost, I do this list every year just for fun. It's not meant to be some super serious ranking of every single game, as these games encompass all all sorts of genres, play styles, budgets, etc. And if you think about it in that way, it's not really a fair comparison. All this is, is just how much I liked each of these games on a personal level, which means it is inherently subjected to my own biases and, of course, preferences. And what's more, in this video, I'm going to be moving pretty quickly. I'm just going to be giving the ranking a little bit about the game and moving on. I have reviewed all of these games. If you want my full thoughts on them and a slightly more objective take, admittedly, those reviews exist. Please go watch them. But of course, this video will be a little more personal as I'm just going to tell you whether or not I liked them, what I didn't like about them, liked about them, etc. So with no further ado, let's dive into it. At the very bottom of the list, we have my least favorite game this year, which was Stray Blade. And while I admit some people might enjoy this game, for me it was a weird blend of Metroidvania and Souls-like elements with a very bright color palette that I just don't think worked. It was also pretty buggy, the combat wasn't enjoyable, they wound up having to overhaul it completely some months later, and while I can see where someone might enjoy this game, for me, I just didn't really care for it, and it really missed the mark. These days, though, it's on a pretty deep sale thanks to its pretty frosty reception, which might make it easier to stomach for some people. Second from the bottom, however, we have Forspoken, a much maligned game that had a variety of issues on launch. That said, I was able to find a fair few things I enjoyed about the title, which you can check out in my review, but the reason this is still so close to the bottom is down to a few different reasons. For starters, it ran pretty horribly on PC on its launch. In addition to that, the world was mostly empty, with only one city, which was a separate instance from the rest of the world, and while you ran around that mostly empty and formulaic world, you would get to go places and find notes and read about all this cool stuff that happened way before you got here, which in my opinion was a lot of squandered potential. But the reason I put this above Stray Blade in particular is that I do think the combat had its moments where it was fun and doing combos and things like that and moving around the world did have something to offer, but as a complete experience still wasn't very good. But then we have Redfall, another much maligned game this year from Arcane Studios, specifically Arcane Austin. This one saw a besieged town of Redfall Fall or Island of Redfall, dealing with a vampire menace, but unfortunately was let down by a lot of poor NPC AI, other issues, and while I personally could see the potential it had, even I had to say on launch that it just wasn't something I would pay for. That said, the game has received several updates since then, and now, if you were to buy it, I think the game is decent, but its base price is still $70, which you're going to have a hard time getting anyone to pay for, and quite frankly, I still think the game is a few updates away from being truly good. So while I do think it would be possible for them to turn Redfall around, I don't think you're ever going to make up for it in terms of sales and things like that, which means the effort wouldn't be, I would say, uh, financially responsible, which means I don't think we're going to see much else for this one, which is a shame because, again, I do think the game had potential, I loved the world, the art in particular was great, but the rest of it fell a bit flat. Fourth from the bottom, we have a very small game with Strayed Lights, an interesting action-adventure with some Souls-like parry-based combat that sees a small light fighting against some cinematic boss fights, and this game wasn't bad or anything, it was just incredibly short, it was like four or five hours, and if you don't like the one thing it does, which is that parry-based combat, you're just not gonna like it. And while I enjoyed it well enough, it was just, again, a very, very small title. Next up, however, we have Testament, an interesting, albeit very janky, I would say almost experimental game that received pretty mixed reviews on launch, and while I enjoyed the core of the experience. It was just, again, a very janky experience. A lot of just weird issues, animations, voice acting that was weird. But luckily, I think the game makes up for it a bit in terms of its price. It's like $20. And for that amount of money, I think you could have a good time with this one. It takes a lot of inspiration from other games, mixing a lot of puzzle solving with a decently varied combat system, but the definition of a mixed bag for sure. Moving right along, however, we then have Wo Long. An interesting one because I also played this one the same year that I reviewed Neo. 
which was made by the same company. And it's very safe to say that Wo Long, while a very visually impressive game, is a weird step backward in most every other way, including a loot system that just didn't really make any sense, meaning that you could get the loot you needed or wanted to use for your gear for the rest of the game very early, only to be bombarded with absolutely Diablo-esque levels of loot drops that you simply did not need. It just didn't make any sense, like I said. And while visually the game is gorgeous and I think the core of the combat system is fun enough, as a whole I just don't think the game quite landed. In the number 50 spot, however, we have a small indie game known as Iron Danger. A real-time with pause tactical puzzle style game, which is a bit of an odd combination that sees us taking on various missions with a variety of characters as we wind our way through both combat and an interesting story. It utilizes a time stop and rewind mechanic in combat that makes the game pretty approachable and it's also pretty short. Combine that with a very reasonable asking price and you've got a fun game to mess around with for a couple evenings if you don't want to dive into anything bigger. So while I don't think this game is going to wow anybody, and it certainly didn't wow me, I would say, it was nonetheless fun. Just above that though, we then have Blacktail, an interesting indie title centered around the saga of Baba Yaga, a weird whimsical story with just also incredibly sinister undertones. I think Blacktail is a great title that punches a bit above its weight, but a couple of problems and a relatively small scope keep it from being high up on the list. Number 48, we have Gothic 3, probably the most maligned of the Gothic series to be sure, and definitely an interesting experience to go through these days, because on one hand, it is a broken and buggy mess that even patches and things like that don't quite completely fix. And on the other hand, it still has a lot of hallmarks of Piranha Bytes' signature style, and the open world that you can mess around in is genuinely pretty enjoyable to run around and experience. I enjoy a lot of what Gothic 3 was trying to do, but it fails to stick the landing in many, many ways, and all of that is ignoring the, I would say, extreme difficulty you'll deal with in trying to get this running on modern hardware, to say the least. So there's also that. But then we have Atlas Fallen, a game that is slightly above average in just about every way. It did have the unfortunate distinction of launching right in the middle of many other much larger and better games, but nonetheless, I think Atlas Fallen was a fun time for me, a semi-open world adventure, not honestly terribly unlike Forspoken, but you know, good. And if you like a fast-paced action game, I think this one is still worth checking out. Right above that, however, we have Scars Above, an interesting game that sees a researcher from a science team sent to investigate a strange object that appears in Earth's atmosphere, only to be teleported away to a strange planet, having to struggle every moment to just survive against a myriad of hostile life forms, makes for a very fun action adventure with a decently interesting story. I enjoyed this one quite a bit. It's another short and sweet title with a decent price tag that you can probably knock out in a couple of days, and while it's not overly ambitious, I did find it very enjoyable. At number 45, though, we have Atomic Heart, a game that kind of just came and went, really. It was all anybody was talking about for a week or two there, and then it was just gone. On one one hand, I enjoyed Atomic Heart. I think a lot of the bosses and the fights were interesting, though it was a bit more linear than you might initially expect given some of the open areas. So while I did have fun with this game, I would say its probably biggest drawback is the fact that it doesn't really break a lot of new ground in many ways. I would say this game is just Bioshock, but prettier. But overall, it was still pretty fun. But then we have Other Side, a very atmospheric TRPG that puts us in the role of a team of daughters, as they're called, who all serve their mother, the sort of commander in this situation, who is using her daughters to fight off all sorts of Cthulhu-esque monsters and things against a very artistic black and white style, with some pretty compelling mechanics around, I would say, attrition and sacrifice. So in many ways, I would say this game isn't like wild in terms of TRPGs or anything. It's pretty focused. It knows exactly what it wants to do in terms of its mechanics. And I think the interplay of those things is interesting, though admittedly, this one is only this high pretty much because of the these are the kind of games I prefer, and this one is a great focused tactical experience. In our next spot, we have another tactical experience with the Lamplighters League, the latest outing from Harebrain Schemes that was met with a pretty frosty response, not so much from the general public, but the game's publisher, Paradox Interactive, who honestly, in a lot of ways, seems like they really sent this game out to die, because not even a week after its release, they announced that it had failed and that they were cutting ties with Harebrain Schemes, which makes the marketing and things around this game just very odd all around. But even getting past that, the game did have a few issues with performance and some mechanics that I would say didn't really 
do anything to push the envelope. But nonetheless, in spite of those things, this, I would say, XCOM light style of gameplay is pretty enjoyable if you like those sort of games, which I did. And if the performance had been a little better, my own review would have been more positive in general, because when the game was working, I did enjoy it. But then in the number 42 spot, we have a very frustrating one for me personally, which was Star Wars Jedi Survivor. An admittedly great game that I enjoyed quite a bit that was unfortunately broken on release when it comes to PC, and as this is a PC channel, certainly came up. I think it expanded upon a lot of the things its previous game, Fallen Order, did well, but it ran like garbage on release, and to this day, despite patches and things coming up over the course of the year, as this one launched pretty early, it's still having issues on PC. Though, when the game ran, it was great. Next up, though, we have Miasma Chronicles. From the team behind Mutant Year Zero, we have a very similar experience set in a different universe, a post-apocalyptic America, that I would say refines and adjusts many of the mechanics and things at play in Mutant Year Zero. And I enjoyed it quite a bit. I think the story was a little too close to Star Wars, to be honest with you, but it was still pretty good. And while it can be a little bit too puzzly for some people, as tactical games go, I had a lot of fun with it. Which I would say is the part of the list where we're moving into games that were just mostly fun. Which brings me to a game in my number one preferred genre of CRPGs with Space Wreck. Space Wreck is a very small indie CRPG that is highly replayable, albeit very short. A run-through of this is probably going to be like 5 to 10 hours maybe at most, but there's multiple endings, tons of ways to approach individual situations as we try to guide our character across a bunch of different Space Wrecks searching for fuel to get us back home and dealing with all sorts of other situations. So if you like CRPGs but most of them are a little too involved for you, I think this is the perfect solution to that. In the 39 spot, we have Bioshock Infinite. In my opinion, the weakest of the three Bioshock games, which I finally got around to playing this year, and Infinite was definitely the worst one. I would say it has the best gameplay of the three by far, but everything else just wasn't very enjoyable in comparison to the other two, and it felt much more like an on-the-rail shooter than the immersive sim qualities of the previous two. So while I still think it was decently enjoyable, of those three games, it's definitely the weakest. Just above that, that, though, we have Remnant 1, a game I wanted to play before Remnant 2 launched, just to see what all the buzz was about, because I hadn't played it before this year. And while it often gets billed as Dark Souls with guns, I think it's definitely more of an ARPG with some mild Souls-like elements, but in any event, it was a very fun game, though a tiny bit janky here on its first outing. And then coming up on the middle of the pack, we have Hogwarts Legacy. This one is an interesting title. Because while I enjoyed it after having played it early in the year, I do think it benefited from launching in a pretty good place, surrounded by other titles which were just terribly, I would say, optimized for PC in particular. But as someone who grew up reading all those books and everything, I definitely wanted to check this game out. And while from that standpoint, I think it absolutely does what it's trying to do, as an RPG, I think it falls flat in a few places, such as consequences for your actions as a teenager going around murdering people in the countryside seems to have no ramifications, and the open world itself is a bit formulaic. But other than that, I think the game has a lot going for it, and succeeds at what it was trying to do. Though, over the course of the year, I do think it got vastly outshone by a lot of other games, many of which we're about to get into. In the number 36 spot, we have a Sea of Stars, largely an homage, let's say, to the JRPGs of yesteryear, with my only real complaint being that the combat never evolved much beyond the initial basics, with everything else admittedly being more nitpicky. That said, the game has a gorgeous art style, it nails a lot of what made those games great while adding a couple of new additions as well, which makes it no surprise that this game won Best Indie of the Year. But nonetheless, in the 35 spot, we then have Blood West a stealth FPS game that nonetheless can be approached a little more guns blazing if you prefer, where you play a revenant brought back from the dead to deal with all sorts of paranormal issues in the Wild West. And while the game's story wound up being a bit of a letdown, everything else about the game was very enjoyable for me. I think the minute-to-minute -minute gameplay was exceptional, and I had a lot of fun playing this one. Coming in at number 34 with another CRPG, we have Dark Envoy. From the makers of Tower of Time, we have an indirect CRPG 
sequel that expands into, I would say, a full-blown CRPG, whereas Tower of Time was admittedly more of a dungeon crawler. And while this game is still a bit limited in scope as it is an indie title, I would say it's a big step forward for them with a lot of choice and consequence, interesting ways to approach its real-time with pause combat system alongside unique mechanics in that space, such as drawing the area of effect for certain abilities, made for a really enjoyable time if you enjoy this particular style of game which I do, obviously, so here we are. Moving right along, though, we have Shadow Gambit, the last game out the door from Me 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 Games, as they are, in fact, closing the shop, shutting the business down, etc., though they certainly went out on a high note. Shadow Gambit is a stealth strategy game, which that studio was known for, and they really knocked it out of the park with this one. If you like that type of gameplay, Shadow Gambit is definitely a must-play. It does a lot of things really well, with one of my only real gripes being that the enemy layout of any given island doesn't really change from mission to mission, daytime, nighttime, etc., which is admittedly a bit of a minor complaint, because otherwise I think the game is fantastic, and it just recently got some DLC that adds more people to play in the missions, more missions, more islands, etc. So a great game all around, even if admittedly the genre isn't quite as near and dear to me as CRPGs and ARPGs, which is why our next spot with number 32 is Divine Divinity, the first of the Divinity series, and a game from more than 20 years ago that while I had played before, I hadn't actually gotten around to reviewing and wanted to make a review for, so here it is. Now, this one admittedly isn't that fair because I love the Divinity series, and Divine Divinity, which admittedly is a dumb name that they didn't even want to give it but were forced to by a publisher, is still ahead of its time. And while you might run into some issues trying to play this on modern hardware, I do think it still holds up in a variety of ways, as it is kind of a Diablo-like with a more rpg focus where you can run around to various towns, complete quests, approach things in a variety of ways, etc. Again, a really exceptional game for its time that went on to spawn the Divinity series as a whole, which makes it wild that their next game they released after this was just a travesty. Though, speaking of older games, in the 31 spot we have The Witcher 1, a game I actually played many, many years ago when I was in high school, but it's a game I have fond memories of, as it is one of those games that introduced me to the fact that a lot of RPGs could have have these serious, mature themes alongside a well-built and realized world. Realistically, the only thing I don't like about The Witcher 1 is that it hasn't quite aged super well. And while I still think it holds up decently, it has more than its fair share of jank. But it's a game I remember fondly, if only for the time of my life that I played it, and getting to play it again this year, including the Enhanced Edition, which had some stuff that I hadn't actually seen since then, was a real treat and a trip down memory lane for me, which is why it's so high up on this list. Speaking of yet Yet another older game, though, we have Gene Forge in the next spot. More specifically, it is the remake of the original title, so Gene Forge 1 Mutagen. The Gene Forge series is one of several larger CRPG series from Spiderweb Software, which is essentially like one or two people working on indie CRPGs. Gene Forge, though, is set in a world where shapers have mastered the ability to create life and shape creations that they then use to serve them, which of course raises all sorts of ethical questions that the game then goes on to tackle. And while I still have yet to play the other, I believe, four entries in this particular series, and I'm looking forward to diving into the sequel, which is also getting a remake early next year. One of the many series of CRPGs you'll talk about when you look at isometric CRPGs of old, and ones I'm admitting still working through myself, but Gene Forge was a real treat. I enjoyed it a lot. And while the gameplay and, you know, mechanics and things like that are relatively simple, I think it still punches well above its weight. Which brings us to the number 29 spot with the original Bioshock. As I mentioned earlier, this is a series that I played through for the first time this year, and the first one is still remarkable in how it reveals rapture and everything to you. The atmosphere and things like that are just incredible in the original Bioshock. And while the gameplay mechanics are certainly a bit limited, and I think they went to much better places in the follow-ups. Bioshock 1 is still a great game, and I don't think I need to tell most people watching this video that. We have Risen 2, a very, I would say, polarizing title from Piranha Bytes that took the Risen series in a very different direction. And to sort of rehash, admittedly, my own review, I think Risen 2 was a really fun game, but a terrible sequel to Risen 1. But as a standalone title, I really enjoyed Risen 2. It has a lot of those hallmark things from Piranha Bytes. It tries a few new things. The combat system is quite a bit different, I would say, but I still had a lot of fun with it. It just was a very weird departure from the first title. 
But then we have Dishonored, another game I played for the first time this year, and it was certainly a game that lived up to the hype. I'm looking forward to jumping into Dishonored 2 sometime this coming year in 2024, which I was trying to do this year but got sidetracked with new releases. The original title, though, I think was a fantastically told assassin experience with just incredibly detailed level design and a myriad of tools. But my only real complaint about this was that you kind of got actively punished for using a lot of those tools with the bad ending of the game, which didn't quite sit right with me, though the gameplay and everything else beyond that point were fantastic, which is why it's still decently high up on the list all these years later. Just above that, however, we have Bioshock 2, my personal favorite of the Bioshock series, and while it lacks a lot of the grand reveals of the first game, I do think this one is a better game overall, both in terms of its combat and its story direction. Combine that with some incredible DLC with Minerva's Din, and you've got a fantastic game. Though if you grab the Steam release of this one, you might have some problems with some crashes due to the launcher for the game suddenly being added like way after the fact that caused a bunch of issues. But you can set up some options to just bypass that launcher altogether, which will fix the problem for you. Now, in the number 25 spot, we have Risen 3, a game that blends elements of Risen 1 and Risen 2 to make a, I would say, overall very fun experience. And while it's still definitely a little bit different than Risen 1, I do think it incorporates enough of both of those games to come together and make a game that was still pretty enjoyable while keeping that trademark Piranha Bytes style. And while I think the series in general wrapped up a bit, uh, let's say, in a bit of an unsatisfying manner, I think the rest of it was a blast. Next up, though, we have The Witcher 2, my personal favorite of The Witcher series, which might come as a surprise, but The Witcher 2 had a lot more of what I wanted from The Witcher series as a whole, which was this big unraveling story of choice and consequence, and it has just a fantastic story with with multiple paths through the game leading to 16 potential endings, and while I admit that The Witcher 3 is better off gameplay-wise, as The Witcher 2's combat is, is a bit of a mess, the story and the choices, I think, are unmatched. Though, in the number 23 spot, we have a, another JRPG with Chained Echoes. In a not entirely dissimilar situation from Sea of Stars, this game is largely a throwback to a lot of older JRPGs. Though, unlike Sea of Stars, I think this one is a little more expansive in terms of what it was trying to do, which is made more impressive by the fact that it was mostly made by one person. It is a game that can continually surprised me, which made overlooking small things like a few systems being uh, less than ideal, let's say, pretty easy to do. Overall, a great game. I enjoyed it. It was a blast. You should definitely play it. And yes, between this one and Sea of Stars, I would pick Chain Echoes every day. In the number 22 spot, however, we have an ARPG with Hades, another game I played for the first time this year, as I like a good ARPG, and people were telling me I needed to play Hades, and they were not incorrect. Hades is a fantastic fantastic game with a wonderful gameplay loop, with my only real complaint being that at the end of it I was getting tired of running through the same few areas over and over again, which is the one thing I'd like to see improved with Hades 2. In the number 21 spot, we have the original Risen. One of my favorite Piranha Bytes games, period. I loved what they did with Risen. I think they absolutely flubbed the ending, which kind of got to be a recurring theme with the Risen series as a whole, but it took their gothic series, advanced it a ton, made it a little bit more modern. In fact, Risen 1, just recently, uh, earlier this year in January, got a big update, updating it on PC, making it easier to play, bringing achievements, things like that, which was done under their new owner, THQ Nordic. And if you like RPGs at all and you want to check out some of the Piranha Bytes games, I think Risen is one of their best work. And yeah, sure, it's a little bit janky. It's from a genre of games known affectionately as Eurojank, so it's not perfect, but I really did love this game. Not quite as much as I loved their other title, Gothic 2, though, which brings us to our number 20 spot. Gothic 2 is one of those games where you'll hear people talk about it a ton as potentially one of their favorite games of all time. And with good reason, Gothic 2 is very good. It expands on the very unique world of Gothic and takes it to a slightly higher place that, unfortunately, Gothic 3 just never really lived up to. Now, pretty much like every game in the Gothic series, you're going to have to put in some work to get it running on modern hardware, but luckily some dedicated fans have made that pretty easy to do. 
and Piranha Bytes under THQ Nordic have gone back and added Steam Workshop support for this, which made that even easier to do, and it really is a great game. With that in mind, the entire Gothic series is uh, aging to be sure, so some of the mechanics can take a while to wrap your head around, but if you're willing to put in that work, I think Gothic is one of those classic series that everyone who's into RPGs should make an effort to play at some point. They really are very good, in a way that reminds me of something like the Baldur's Gate series, where the originals were also really much loved, but have aged poorly. <laughs> but then we have our number 19 spot with Neo. One of those games that gets Build as technically a Souls-like, but I think manages to turn into its own thing with a remarkably deep combat system that makes me excited to jump into Neo 2, which people say is even better, because while the story of the game was, uh told in a less than straightforward manner. The actual gameplay, the action sequences, all the different things you can do with combat skills, etc. is crazy impressive. And in that manner, the game really holds up. Even their most recent entry of Wo Long couldn't keep up with what this game did in 2017. Definitely one of the better action games I've played. But then in the number 18 spot, we have a shift back to my personal favorite genre, which is why it's so high up on the list, admittedly, which is Colony Ship. A small indie CRPG from the makers of The Age of Decadence, Iron Tower Studio, and they clearly took and learned a lot of lessons from The Age of Decadence and applied them to Colony Ship to make a fantastic indie CRPG. Really, I would say my only downside to this is that I wanted to play more of it and there was not more to be played. I love the premise. You're on this ship heading to a planet you may or may not make it to because it's a generational ship, but the people on that ship fell to a mutiny and now it's kind of every man for themselves in a weird sort of nihilistic state of the fact that everyone could die at any minute if the ship gives out. They don't know if the ship will make it there, etc. And it just leads to a really cool setting and they do a lot of fun stuff to explore it. Like I said, I just wish there was more of it. But then in our number 17 spot, we have a remake of a very old cult classic with System Shock, which was a fantastic time for me to jump into it because the original was so loved and I cover a lot of old games, so people had been asking me to play the original at some point, but the very first one was a little before my time. I was literally one year old when the original game released, so the remake was a natural jumping in point, and I'm glad I did because it is an incredibly faithful remake. They stuck to what that original was, with even some of the older guides working exactly for that game, while also updating some of the mechanics and things to make them a little more approachable without overdoing it. I think System Shock is a masterclass in how to remake a game, and it still definitely shows why the original was so well-loved. Moving right along, though, we next up have Shogunners, a very focused tactical RPG that takes place on a running man style show where people sign up to kill each other for prizes, basically. And it's a fantastic jumping in point for the genre if you're not familiar with it, that is to say TRPGs, as it's definitely a little on the easier side. But it focuses on the action. There's an exploration phase where you'll move through the various levels of the show that involve solving light puzzles, deciding whether or not to take on optional battles, etc and then jumping into the tactical portion of things, which, while nothing crazy, is still really well done. So while sure, Shogunners isn't exactly a big genre-expanding title or anything, it is an incredibly well-done TRPG in a space where you're kind of flooded with those games, honestly, so the fact that it manages to stand out amongst all those just makes it that much better. It's a game that just does everything it's trying to do to a very high degree of quality, set against a unique and fun world. I really enjoyed my time with it. Cracking the top 15, we first have Kingdom Come Deliverance, a remarkably expansive game set in the 15th century of Bohemia. We have a tale, I would say loosely based around real historical events, where we take on the role of Henry, a tried and true peasant who goes through a harrowing ordeal before becoming a knight and learning to make his way in a world where his parents were killed. The first outing for Warhorse Studios, and it was a doozy. At times, it is incredibly janky and awkward, both in its setup and mechanics, but there are other times where you are just truly immersed in what you're doing. Every little random thing matters, like the quality of your clothes the last time your character took a bath, whether or not you've got a torch out at night, and a million other little things. And it's a game that is so much more than the sum of its parts, which made for a really fantastic, 
fantastic and unique game. I've very rarely been more immersed in a game than when I was playing this one, which makes me excited for whatever Warhorse Studios has going next, which is likely a follow-up to this, but nothing has been announced yet. Still, though, a great game, which is why five years later, it is so high up on this list. Now, just above that, in the number 14 spot, we have War Tales, a really great TRPG from this year where we take on the role of a mercenary company just trying to make their way across a dark and gritty medieval universe. It's a game with, I would say, some low fantasy elements. You'll occasionally fight things like ghosts and zombie-esque type things, but for the most part, it's just you against like animals and other people. And it offers an incredibly deep world with a variety of mechanics to engage with as you try to manage your mercenary company to the best of your ability, which leads to a lot of emergent storytelling. My one big drawback and the reason it's not higher on this list is the fact that there isn't like a big main story. Each like section of the map has its own like little contained narrative, but the game is over when you're just kind of done and don't feel like playing anymore so to speak, so you just kind of bring that company to its natural end, whatever that might be for you. And for me, that just lacked a bit of a conclusion, if you will. I was just like, oh, I guess I guess I'm just done now when I finally finished everything. And that's the main thing that kept this game from being higher up on the list for me is just that lack of a satisfying narrative conclusion to things. Otherwise, it was a blast, though. And then rather appropriately in the number 13 spot, we have Starfield, a very polarizing title that I admittedly enjoyed a lot more than a lot of other people did, which was funny because all the way back at the beginning of the year, I put out a uh, predictions video just talking about some things I thought might happen in the gaming world this year. And one of them was that Starfield would be very polarizing and that turned out to be very correct. And now that the dust has settled, I actually might make a separate video about this subject and talk about some of the nuance about things I saw versus how other people saw them, which this video just doesn't have time for. But to keep it short and simple, I agree with a lot of people's complaints and mentioned in my own review, as a matter of fact, despite what people would like to say to the contrary, that the exploration of the game isn't very rewarding. There is very little reason to go out and explore the myriad of planets that are ultimately just kind of empty or have essentially the same layout of individual places. But those things didn't bother me so much because a lot of the refinements to Starfield were changes and things to the general Bethesda Game Studios open world format that I really appreciated, like how they kind of combined Oblivion's more class-oriented system with like perks and things with Skyrim's more, uh, I would say, casual friendly approach to learn by doing, which is to say there's a lot to enjoy about Starfield. I think a lot of people still had some very valid complaints about the title as well, but I enjoyed it quite a bit when it came to the curated content. Once you start looking at like the procedural stuff, after the fact, yeah, I could care less, which is why it is number 13 on the list. Though that is a little bit in combination with the fact that sci-fi isn't really my big thing. Honestly, if they had taken this game systems and applied it to a more fantasy-oriented setting, which is obviously what I'm hoping they do for Elder Scrolls 6, I would have enjoyed it a lot more, and I already enjoyed it quite a bit, which is why it's number 13. But like I said, I might make a dedicated video talking about this one a little more specifically in some of those issues. We'll see. Because for now, we've got to move right along, and next up, we have Lords of the Fallen, a reboot of sorts to a game of the same name that I had quite a bit of fun with, but my main takeaway for this game was that it was frustratingly close to being great. It had a few glaring issues with things like enemy density, the ambushes around every corner, things like that, the baffling decision to initially not have any checkpoints active in New Game Plus, etc. Though the devs have been super reactive to that since this game launched, they have made a ton of updates responding to player feedback, though I do still think they probably were a little too ambitious with this one and working a bit beyond their means. But nonetheless, I think the game is a visual spectacle. A lot of the combat is a ton of fun to mess around with, but still has some of that telltale jank. Overall, though, a game I enjoyed a great deal, and I'd be curious to see where this one lands in like six months or so once they maybe get done updating it constantly, as it certainly is one of the better games I played this year. Which does bring us to the number 11 spot, though, with The Ascent, a slightly older title set in a cyberpunk world via action RPG combat. A game I had a ton of fun with that, again, got frustratingly close to being a great game, but was still very, very good. It is an incredibly dense and realized world that you can explore and take on all sorts of action RPG-oriented missions as you work your way through this cyberpunk dystopia-style tower. But overall, I loved smashing my way through this game. It was a ton of fun. 
And I'd love to see Neon Giant, the game's developer, take some lessons from this so I can see what they do next, because this game was a blast, and I think with some refinements, the next project they work on could be something truly special. Which brings us to our number 10 spot, starting off with Diablo 4. Another, I would say, kind of polarizing title from this year that I do enjoy. But as someone who is very on the record for really loving the Diablo series as a whole, Diablo 2 is one of those games I have played probably more than almost any other game, period. I was obviously excited to play Diablo 4, and while I really do enjoy a lot of the approaches they took to a variety of things in this game, the reason it's still not closer to the top here is because of their insistence on turning it into essentially Diablo the MMO. There's no offline mode, they go off with these events and everything that see you having limited interactions with other players in an attempt to preserve the Diablo-esque style small party size as opposed to something like an actual MMO, which makes it this weird middle ground of a game that oftentimes you aren't really surrounded by anybody, but nonetheless a lot of the systems work off of that fundamental server architecture, which makes implementing something like a single player mode almost certainly not going to happen in the near term at least as it would be a colossal amount of work, I am aware, but that's admittedly kind of my frustration with Diablo 4 and why it's at the number 10 spot, is because instead of making a truly great action RPG, what they've essentially done is tried to make another MMO so they could push people into a cash shop and sell $20 skins rather than spend that dev time made making those skins on improving the game and focusing on things like expansions or meaningful endgame content, etc. So, as you can see, I have a lot of opinions about this. But all of those opinions do come from a place of love. I enjoy the Diablo series as a whole. I think the core game experience of Diablo 4 is fun, but if you approach it like the MMO that they admittedly designed it to be, you're likely to get disappointed at some point, especially towards the end game, which makes it a kind of frustrating game for me to talk about. Because while I enjoy a lot of what they did, I also fundamentally disagree with a lot of their direction that they're trying to take this. Because while I'm sure their shareholders are very happy with the money this kind of thing rakes in, I'm certainly not impressed by it. Which brings us to our number 9 spot, which is Armored Core 6. A game I wasn't even initially planning on reviewing, but the audience, you guys, convinced me to try it out, and I was thoroughly impressed. I enjoyed it much more than I thought I would, both customizing your mech alongside the gameplay of just blowing stuff up as a giant robot was surprisingly well done, and I enjoyed this game immensely more than I thought I would, down to tailoring a mech for a given mission, trying new builds, etc. It was a pretty great time. Which brings us to our number 8 spot, which is Remnant 2. The follow-up, of course, to the original Remnant that I think improves upon a ton of different things. I think they took that original Remnant 1 formula, really refined it, brought in a lot of great additions, expanded on a lot of things, made things a little simpler in terms of builds, perhaps, but I would say my only real gripe about Remnant 2 was the fact that the environments got a little stale, as there were not a ton of worlds or environments for the procedural generation to really pull off of, which can make it get a bit stale after a while. But otherwise, I enjoyed it a lot, and as they add more DLC and environments, I think it will only get better from here. But coming in on the number 7 spot, we have Jagged Alliance 3, the follow-up to cult classic Jagged Alliance 2, a series based around 80s action movies. Jagged Alliance 3 sees you taking on a mercenary company trying to save the Isle of Grand Chien from a myriad of different problems. And overall, it's a game that's a lot of fun. It's certainly very cheesy, B-movie style stuff at times that also blends in a ton of choice and consequence as the actions you take throughout the campaign and how you manage all that stuff will greatly affect the overall outcome for the country at the end of the game, which can lead to a variety of different endings, which made for a really great experience that sort of blends TRPG and CRPG elements that really landed with me. Coming in at number 6, though, we have Lies of P. In my opinion, the best Souls-like that came out this year, which serves as a reimagining of the story of Pinocchio, but with a really great combat system that sees you able to sort of craft and pick apart weapons as they divide themselves into blades and handles that you can mix and match to make something 
something a bit more unique in terms of both abilities and stat scaling, while taking on the robotic puppets of the island of Krat, or more, I would say, grotesque monsters perhaps, set against a surprisingly interesting story to boot. Lies of P is easily one of the best games that came out this year, and with some patches since launch that touched up a few of, I would say, the weaker points, it's only gotten better since launch. But that brings us to the top five, which people who watch my channel regularly will already be quite familiar with, I admit, but nonetheless, in the number five spot we have Aliens Dark Descent. A real-time with pause TRPG, which is a rare thing, you don't see too many of those, this one being set in the Aliens franchise. And while I had my doubts that a game like this could carry on with the suspense and things like that inherent in that franchise, I think they did a surprisingly great job of it, with you constantly being hassled by the approaching hive of aliens and members of a nefarious cult, all while trying to keep your slate of marines in good working condition, so to speak, as they deal with psychological traumas, etc., that make it a pretty tense and thrilling game. I was genuinely surprised by this game, as I only learned about it like maybe two weeks before its launch, and it wound up being much, much better than I thought it would be. So, my hat's off to them. A game I really didn't even see coming wound up being one of my favorite games this year, and you should definitely check it out if you haven't. Now, in the number four spot, we have an interesting one with Cyberpunk 2077, as I re-reviewed this title after the launch of the Phantom Liberty DLC and Update 2.0, which overhauled the game, which made my previous rendition of my review after 100% on the game's initial release, kind of outdated, let's say. So with all those changes, I decided to jump into it, check it out again, and while I still don't think it's the game they initially marketed, it is nonetheless a really great game. It's a blast to play these days, and it was nice to see that game finally get its due, even if it took three years. Now, in the number three spot, we have, I would say, the second biggest CRPG out this year with Warhammer 40k Rogue Trader. The first CRPG set in the Warhammer 40k universe from Alcat Games, the people behind my favorite CRPG, Wrath of the Righteous. Obviously, I was going to check this one out, and while I haven't finished the review after 100% for this yet, it is, needless to say, a pretty great game. There's a lot to enjoy about it, especially if you like Warhammer or just the genre in general, though I do think there are a couple things holding it back in comparison to Alcat's previous work, despite it being better bug-wise, though the bugs are still an issue, but I'll save a more in-depth deep dive for that for the actual review, though I do have a launch review up already. Which brings us to the number two spot, which is Octopath Traveler 2. One of the games this year I really loved, Octopath Traveler 2 is a JRPG that rather than being an homage to the past actually tries to move things forward a bit, of course building off the blocks of the first game at the same time, and really leaning into those HD 2D graphics that Square Enix has been pioneering. And while I think a game like this is going to struggle with, I would say, mass appeal, just kind of getting people to try it, I think for the people who do try it, it will honestly surprise you and be a great game for you, as the story and mechanics and the way it weaves together is just a blast of a time. And because of that, I really can't recommend it enough. If you find yourself with some time and you're looking for something to play, I promise you this game is worth it. But that does bring us to our number one spot, which is absolutely no surprise to anyone either both familiar with my channel or otherwise, and that is Baldur's Gate 3, a game I covered a ton up to and after its release. I have to actually cover it a little bit more when I do my honor mode. I plan on making a video about the build comp I wind up using for that. But otherwise, it's a game that I don't have too much more to say about because I have said it all a myriad of times across a ton of different videos, including a review after 100% that took me 500 hours, and I'm still planning on playing the game a little bit more if that tells you anything. It is my most played game this year, it is my most enjoyed game this year, and while I still certainly have things I can nitpick about it, as I always want to see the things I love become that much better, BG3 is my game of the year and it is not close. But that is pretty much going to do it for this video. So there have been all of the games I reviewed this year ranked. I certainly hope you enjoyed it. By all means, let me know down below what you think about these, though I'm sure everyone will love it and there will be much rejoicing, as sharing your opinion on the internet certainly never leads to disagreements. But in all seriousness, it's been a tremendous year for games. I doubt we'll see another year like this for quite some time, to be frank, for a variety of different
different factors, honestly, but sharing this year and all these reviews and news with you has been truly special and has meant the world to me personally. So whether this is the first video of mine you're watching or if you've watched every single one I've put out this year, thank you for being here. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz, but regardless of any of that, truly, thank you again. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.